learning all the rules so you can break all the rules. You can't break them or you can't, you know, adjust them and be innovative within them if you don't understand them. Episode 83. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And before I go into introducing this week's guests, I just want to say that I hope everybody is well and safe and looking after themselves and practicing social distancing and being responsible. This is really unprecedented times that we're experiencing right now with coronavirus. Um, And it's really, for a lot of people, it can be very stressful. Um, It can be very difficult, particularly on our businesses. Um, Lots of clients perhaps pulling out projects. Um, It's a lot of uncharted territory for many of us. I recently released a webinar where I was actually covering uh, about coronavirus and what it means for the architectural industry. So make sure if you get a chance this week to jump on and see that webinar, make sure you're signed up to the email list and there'll be details there. And I might be able to put the details into the information of this podcast as well. So please stay safe. Keep at home if you can. Um, The podcast goes into a lot of details about Uh, remote working, some of the mindset needed to be able to stay effective and calm in difficult times and stress and how we can actually transform this period into a period of growth and development and leadership. So check that out, stay informed and uh, be safe. So this week I am speaking with Zara Nasralla and Remy Connolly-Taylor of Kit London, uh, which is an independent property development business focused on unlocking constrained infill sites through design-focused property development. Um, And it was amazing speaking with these two. I absolutely loved it. And they very nicely, the week before, invited me to go and actually visit a whole load of their sites uh, which are kind of um, distributed around East London to actually see the types of developments that they're working on and it was absolutely brilliant and Remy is also the founder of Remy T, uh, CT Studio um, and she's it's an architectural and design practice and she's got a lot of experience working on complex infill sites and together, these two are a, a formidable team. And they go into a lot of detail in this conversation about how they've instigated their development sites, how they actually go about finding the right sites, how they work with developers, the processes of appraisal that they put their sites through. So it's really, really informative um, conversation. And for me, these two are just so inspiring. It's just absolutely brilliant to hear um, designers, architects, developers coming together, building something new and transforming our city. So sit back, relax and enjoy Zara and Remy. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next, what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book 
a 15 minute chat with me. I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Sarah and Remy, absolute pleasure to have you both on the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you for having, Thank you for having us. us. Where are we? We're in this kind of amazing... In the timber yard in Here East. So near the Olympic Park or part of the Olympic legacy in Stratford. And this is the location of where Kit London is and Remy, where your studio is. Where the magic happens. Where the magic happens. And you guys have got a really interesting relationship. You're kind of co-founders of, of Kit, which is development, and you've got your own architectural studio and you're doing all sorts of really exciting projects and yes. you've kind of come fresh straight out of university, not yes. mucked around and like just <laughs> set up your own practice and then getting into development. So I, I think I want to kind of begin the conversation by talking about you guys' relationship and I also want to talk about the beginnings of your practice and how that's kind of grown Evolved. into 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 kit. So yes. what yep. what is what is kit? Oh, okay. <laughs> we should have a ready formed answer, shouldn't we? Kit's a bespoke de- property development practice, or property developers, based in East London, focused on East London. Our sites are generally infill or backland sites. And we use design as the way to unlock them. Mm. That right? That sounds about right. The cracks in the city is what we're interested in. So it's all urban gap sites. All urban gap sites, and we've started off by looking at you know residential typology, something that we're comfortable with, something that we know, mm. and trying to explore how to push that within those gap sites. And then we're already starting to strategize in regards to understanding how we can bring new typologies or things that we're used to within these gap sites as well, because we're coming across more and more commercial opportunities that we're trying to investigate and understand. Yeah, understand the opportunity in commercial, so moving beyond residential. Obviously, Mm. there's a huge shift in retail and what does the high street look like moving Mm. forward? So that's something we're just dipping our toes in, but up until now, it's been primarily residential. And and how did you two come together? (laughs) (laughs) So as part of finding our sites... Um, we do a lot of direct to vendor and that was something that I was doing before meeting Remy so writing letters that can involve going onto the planning portal and and writing letters at the moment to people who've maybe refused planning at that time I was looking for sites with planning to see if they worked so I contacted Remy through a letter Remy thought I was a developer and could be her client a new potential client (laughs) that I thought I'd go and have a coffee with and say oh yes I've got a building not to sell you but I'd love to work with you Um, And then it was quite interesting because we (laughs) we connected and I found um, the way Remy speaks about and the way she understands construction. So design is paramount, but how does that actually translate into the construction and is it feasible to build? Mm. And does that then relate to the end prices? So her understanding of development really interested me. So I actually, after probably the third meeting... I had a phone call from a vendor who I'd written a letter to. So I phoned Remy and said, okay, fine. So who who were you working for? Were you operating independently or...? Yeah, independently. So I was trying to... So I'd started out identifying that I was interested in development and I was exploring the different avenues um, as to what commercially works. And people who who, um, look at multiple sites will agree with this that finding sites with planning is very difficult to purchase them at a price that works Mm. unless you're a builder because there's always someone who can build more cheaply than you or who doesn't have finance costs so I was evolving into finding more sites I knew that going direct was working but I just needed to evolve that so I had already moved towards sites without planning um, but was still uh, looking at the other sides, right, it was so, just so, so these are sites that are perhaps not even on the market. None of them all. are on the market. Okay, so it's mm-hmm. very sort of proactive. You're there on yeah. Google, Google Maps, looking around. Yeah, but. Google Maps, writing letters, and that has all evolved. Now, now we go and <laughs> knock on doors and jump fences. And things, but yeah, very, very proactive. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Great. So and then so you so then I phoned Remy saying, "Okay, I've got one. Do you want to try?" You know, probably a bit cocky and we're like, come on, let's have a look then. Let's see what you can do. Let's see what you can do. <laughs> and Remy came out with, Remy said, oh, I've already got a feasibility on this one. And I said, oh, 
did the landowner contact you? And you said, no. <laughs> no, they didn't, but I know that site. I've driven past it, and I love it. So I just did a feasibility for fun. <laughs> and so she had it on her computer ready to send, and we reviewed it, and we went into conversation with that vendor. Yeah. We carried on offering on that site yes. up until probably about a month ago. Yeah. Uh, we haven't managed to get it for the price we wanted. but And then from there, slowly it flourished. So we didn't jump straight, straight in. in yeah. um, tested the water and now we're almost a year and a half on. And I think we just kind Strong. of started to work. We realised that we were working more and more cohesively mm-hmm. and we just had a very clear vision in regards to you know, how we want to develop and every, you know, and not just develop the single product, but also mm. a series of developments and our vision for, you know, each site was so cohesive that that's when it kind of clicked into kit. And yeah, we kind we of started looking at the larger picture, didn't we? Yeah, we had some conversations, but both of us see this as a career. Yeah. We're not really interested in trying to pull as much profit out of any single project and then move on. This isn't about you know, financial freedom in the way that some people talk about it. Mm. This is a career and legacy in our business. Mm. So a we sat style. down and like, <laughs> hard working <laughs> lifestyle. So, so, how, so how does it work in terms of kit, your own studio and the kind of business model of the of the properties? Are you are they built to sell, are they built to rent or what's the so uh, currently it's built to sell yeah. because we're just starting. So we need to gain a bit of capital to be able to allow us to have the freedom to hold. It is a mm-hmm. goal of ours that we would love to hold all of our, <laughs> hold all of our you know, structures that we're working on. Um, but at the moment they're for build to sell. But then it's, you know, it's interesting because we have to understand lifestyle. We're having to really understand the end view, um, user from you know a design perspective but also highly from a development perspective and it's quite interesting already when we go out and talk about the homes you know it's interesting the market that's already starting to approach us you know we're getting a lot of people who want to buy the homes are retirees people who still want a glamorous home but they want something maybe smaller or very modern and that's you know very sustainable to live in and they've you know got visions of wanting to move on to the next phase of their life in a really exciting space and they've also got the financial freedom to do so so it's quite interesting to understand that market that that has come up in conversations Mm. and so give us a little flavor of the kind of you know we had a lovely afternoon a couple of weeks ago (laughs) where you you very generously showed me around (laughs) parts of east london London. (laughs) on a very cold afternoon (laughs) sorry about that we we had policemen inquiring about what we were doing and all sorts of stuff (laughs) but can you give us a little flavor of some of the sites that you've got how many you've got going yeah um Mm -hmm. and and what you're sort of doing doing with them and, and the kind of the financial structures behind them how they're how they're operating um, so I think start speaking about Maryland. That's a good one. So that's in construction now. So Maryland's in construction now. So, so that is you before I met you as the as yeah. the studio and you purchasing the site. Yeah. So prior, to, so one of the reasons why we're so cohesive is the studio actually started with a development, which is Maryland House, a place which was originally for me to work and live and kind of freelance. Yeah. <laughs> which was a scrap of land that had failed planning, I think it was four times, which I bought on auction very naively, not really understanding the realms of development, but was able to get a house on it, which is... 8.5 pretty- by 9 metres down. <laughs> yeah, to the pavement edge and all the rest of it, <laughs> a lot of light constraints. Um, bought that site and then was able to get a house on it, mostly underground, so it's a basement, ground and first floor. Um, and that one's in construction. We're very excited. The roof's just gone on. The superstructure's mm. up. We're just about to get, you know, the facade's just about to take action. Um, and then from that one, I was able to leverage to buy a secondary one, which was Birkbeck. The other lovely large site, which is 6 by 11, again, to the pavement edge and had an, a series of other issues. Yeah. Um, and that kind of got me into the mindset of understanding development and understanding mitigating the risk of these opportunities. um, Through design. Through design. And so then that was my development background that kind Mm. of started to allow us to merge to become kit. Um, That Mm. one's also received planning and goes into construction at the beginning of April. Because it's, you know, to to buy a site that's had planning permission failed 
four Multiple times, times is quite, you know, for a lot of developers, they'd be like, no, I'm not going to, I don't want to deal with this. Yes, it's really interesting to, <laughs> to show investors and also to show the craziness of the sites when you go to them and say, mm. listen, there's going to be a three bedroom house on this and all the rest of it. Um, but you know, you mitigate it through understanding how volume works. You know, when you go to Maryland, everyone's like, wow, this is massive. When it was the bare site, everybody kept saying, there's not a site here, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is a car parking space or this is... But I think with design, you start to understand volume and then that allowed us to mitigate risk. And also understanding the opportunities that due to, you know, both of um, the two sites, Birkbeck and um, Maryland... They had failed planning, you know, a series of times, which mm. meant that I was able to purchase cheap, which allowed me to have a higher construction cost. And with that higher construction cost, it allows you to be, you know, innovative in other ways. So yeah. with Maryland, it was the basement. With Birkbeck, it was, you know, in regards to the finish and the volumes internally, you know, the structure just stepped down into the ground. Not by as much by meter to its max point, but it allows you to investigate other opportunities that you may have not been able to do if you buy at a higher cost. So it's mitigating risk in different ways, and, I understand. The and, and what do you think was one of your abilities? Or why were you able to get planning and other people weren't? Stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think one of the big things is just... it's. You know, you're going into having a conversation with planners. We've had a great, you know, relationship with all the planners that we've spoke to so far. And that's because we're discussing lifestyle and quality. Mm. And, you know, we're not wanting, we don't, like Sarah mentioned, it's not just about creating, trying to get as much money out of this, you know, the site as possible. You know, a lot of all our structures step down to the surrounding area. We're not trying to maximise the volume necessarily in that way, even though we now have a 3.1 rule of all, most of our living spaces have a 3.1 volume and we have great internal heights. Mm. It's more the fact that we're trying to say to them, you know, we want to create quality on this site. And most of our sites are literally scrapyards, literally. <laughs> so we're saying we're wanting to them. replace. <laughs> you've seen them. You've seen the fridges and leftover car parts and all the rest of it. And we're saying we're wanting to replace this with something that is going to be, is going to add to the street. And then also we discuss, you know, from a um, macro to micro relative to the site. So we'll discuss with them that we're going to develop the surrounding context and we're going to develop the house and we're going to, we show them renders of internal, showing them the quality of the lifestyle that people will be able to live within these spaces. And we're discussing a, a much larger story. And yeah. I think that, you know, gets people on board. And also we kind of really massively allow for a lot of time to kind of work through mm -hmm. it with them. And we want to hear, you know, planners get to see hundreds and hundreds of schemes and they also know the areas very well. So they give us a lot of information that allows us to also, you know, evolve our scheme. And I think that's where we kind of are able to, you know, get these uh, through you told me and navigate. Like the last time we were spoken and we were on one of the sites and you were like, yeah, I'm quite prepared to, you know, be there right at the beginning of the morning, camp out if I have oh, to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will sit, I've done it multiple times. I will sit downstairs in the planning office and wait. I'm more than happy to do it. Or, you know, if they say, I don't understand this, I will be in the next day happy to explain it to them. or happy to send over physical models. We've done one, even for very small schemes, one-to-one -one details and literally like have to physically roll it in when they're concrete mm. slabs and the team are definitely having to flex their muscles but you know we care about the quality of each product whatever the scale and we care about the context it sits in and I think that comes across yeah mm -hmm. and so we're happy to evolve all the schemes have evolved in planning and that's absolutely fine but I think it's the fact that we really truly are wanting to get quality um and, you know, like we both mentioned, we're from East London, so yeah. our, even our parents would kill us in regards to us, you know, leaving <laughs> rubbish in their back garden. And I think because it's a big, it's a big vision and it's a long-term view and it's a career, there's no point taking shortcuts now. Everything we yeah. do now is building the foundation for, for years to come. Yeah. And it's opened up, I mean, it's opened up opportunities in terms of sites, but it's mm. also something that I think investors want to be involved in mm. they obviously want to return on their money but they also want to be involved in something that's exciting and fresh and sustainable and alive. yeah I think it's also they get you, I think you hit the nail on the head in regards to it's sustainable yeah and it's also legacy 
in a way, it sometimes is. It's legacy, it, sometimes yeah. it is legacy, and well, also. Well, what, what would you say are the sort of the, the kind of foundations of making something a career or long term or sustainable? What are the elements to? I mean, the first you say it often is that we're completely aligned in the vision. The vision is Mm. a huge big picture. It's design is first and foremost, and we don't compromise on that. We factor into our appraisals high build costs, and if it doesn't work with high build costs accounting for design features or, you know, woven throughout, then we don't take it on. The areas we, we work in need to be able to support those values and there needs to be the lifestyle in the market um, at the end. So we're very committed, I think, to the vision mm. of KIT. Mm. Mm. Uh, what else makes it sustainable? But the I fact that we have a good relationship. We have a really good relationship. Helps. Yeah. And I think it's the whole trust thing. You know, We've both worked independently by ourselves and we were very also um, seeded in that in a lot of ways. But I think we've been able to... I think it's not just the vision of the products themselves, it's the vision of the company itself mm-hmm. and how you know developers are perceived and how we want to be perceived and it, it's very important our relationship with our vendors where we really enjoy it, you know, going and spending time with yeah. them on our Saturdays and Sundays. I think we're both so committed and it's we always have jokes when we meet up, you know, in coffee shops who's getting there first because sometimes we have days I'm famous sometimes for being Both late, late. To them, some of them. <laughs> but sometimes when we're really excited one of us there is you know a couple we're hours early first, you, know? you know I think it's we're very you know committed right all hours the relationships as well and that goes throughout so we have really good relationships with our vendors we take the time we do what we say we're going to do and we take the time to keep them mm. involved mm. and I think in many ways we go because you have a direct relationship with them you're not going through an agent we go over and above to try and understand what it is that they actually want out of working with us because it's not always money so what is it and how can we structure it then with the planning department you take a lot of time as you said to nurture that relationship and work with them mm, really important. our investors we you know go over and above with so I think at every stage of even resales you're already having meetings with who the agents might be that we'll be working with so at, at every stage um, we're building relationships mm. with our construction partners. You know, we go out for drinks when we reach the top of the building, you know. <laughs> so I think relationships is huge. People wanting to come back and work with us and people talking very highly about our, us and our business. And, and what's the relationship between you two in terms of roles? Like, who does what? How do you how do you distinguish? Because <laughs> you've come from both very different backgrounds. Yes. Like obviously, you're from a design background and you've got mm. a real understanding and care from development and mm. you've got a head for the, the figures and the sort of the other uh, parts of development what how, who does what how, yeah. how is that established and do so, you ever get involved in the design and yes so I think we both actually get it we both have a holistic view of it all and we both have opinions and have a voice in all aspects of the business mm. but equally it's actually been a very natural and organic mm. division but there is a division of roles and responsibilities so there's stuff that if you know, if Remy wants to know where we're at with the legal process, you would, although you're in every single email, but <laughs> you would probably say, you know, what's going on. Um, but for sure, there are things that Remy does that I could never do. Um, and they're so fundamental to what we do. But at the same time, you know, one of your big things is that I have to love every development we do. So she from a design perspective Mm. we're both very involved I understand planning but Remy will run the feasibility and although I'll run the numbers I couldn't possibly do that without understanding volume wise what can fit on the site so we do have we do come from very different there's a story we tell like natural (laughs) skill sets there's a story we were in Costa one Saturday or Sunday (laughs) and we had some stuff that needed to be done for the business and we had discussed what needed to be done, but at no point had we discussed who would do what. And we turned up and we had both worked on completely polar. So one of the things was we needed a, a business name. So Remy had gone and brainstormed all these amazing names and we were discussing those. And we also needed to work on a JB agreement for our first site that we'd secured. And I had <laughs> sat there and gone through an 18 page document without discussing it but you can very clearly see it would have taken me ages to brainstorm a name because that isn't my (laughs) greatest strength but equally I don't think you would have enjoyed 
going through a legal contract very mm. much at all. So somehow. Yeah. And then we get to, it's great because we'd like Sarah said, we get to, you know, weave and bounce off of mm. each other and get each other to appreciate all the different roles. And I think one we take a lot of responsibility yeah. you know for you know our sections of work but I think we also take responsibility in appreciating you know you know the overview of everything that's needed to kind of build the business so mm-hmm. we both are very committed in regards to the conversation on, and are separately able to give isolated pretty much the same pitch yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we do literally most likely say exactly the same pitch now as each other you know in regards to how we sell kit because we're so aligned, e- aligned and integrated into you know the process Sarah's you know around the design discussing the materials with us understanding why we choose what we do you know we do do the presentation <laughs> of the design at some point but to she, me to Sarah <laughs> and sometimes she won't let me see the design so I'm in the studio and I know they're working on our project <laughs> but you won't let me <laughs> see it because they hide the screen <laughs> Sometimes if you go out, I try and say to them, Remy said, I can see. And they're like, no, she didn't. (laughs) (laughs) But I think we want you to have the wow factor that, you know, a lot of clients do. And I appreciate that. But then usually once you've seen it, you know, it's also the fact that you've seen the feasibility. You see us discussing the project. You're able to understand the dialogue that's happening mm-hmm. around why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. And also the just the volume of work that goes in and the, you know, the fact that we're, it's not that we create a design and then that's it. Like, you know, how designers work, but can see the amount of iterations for, you know, each project. Which, and, is, which is so rare for a developer often to kind of have yeah. that kind of, Exposure. Yeah, and I'm yeah. often a, a complaint that many architects have is like, oh, people don't know how much how well, long it took to, to get, get to this point. I know yeah. it's really simple and it looks, but you know, it, it was like a month of work just yeah. for iteration. So it's, yeah. But then also, and then I appreciate, and you appreciate, but I then it's the same it. in reverse. I get to mm. see. I think I've even at a much higher scale understand you know the amount of work that goes into a development on mm. the front end prior to even getting to the point where, you know, the, the designer gets to start working on the scheme. Yeah. There's so much volume of work and risk and mitigation and conversation and strategy and also just understanding of, you know, the political climate and just yeah. all the responsibilities that to even get to a point of even bringing the consultants yeah. on board. So we're both able to kind of appreciate that time because there's a lot of time on the front end that happens it's not just you see your site and like you know a couple of weeks later it's yours and be even nice just to find it it would be nice could, if it could was you go through that process of like what happens how when we... you like how you actually go and find the site what's the you know what does it yeah. look if i was a kind of a fly on the wall or a cameraman mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what is it I and mean, then what do you do you'd see me staring at google maps <laughs> <laughs> oh god so you're use... riding slowly past the streets of <laughs> <Yeah>. east london <laughs> so i use a software which lots of people can tap into it's a really good software called land insight and right. what it does is it gives you the map view but it overlays ownership titles to it so you do so you can then see the boundary lines which allows you to very quickly see if a site is larger than the others Mm. Um, so once I've seen something that is larger I think I've got better at being able to then review things like you know access the opportunities size Mm. Um, is it actually an opportunity and if I think even just maybe or broadly yes I'll highlight it and from there either send well we decide how to approach it but usually maybe send a letter first on a weekend, we'll go out door knocking once a month at actually, least. Actually, to the owner's house. To the owner. Yeah. So of Hello. that long list, yeah. I'll select 10 to 15 short list. We'll probably manage between 5 or 10 that we'll go and knock on their door. I think 13 is our maximum that we've doors, that we've knocked, but they probably didn't answer. So Yeah, a lot of them probably didn't answer. <laughs> or slam the door. <laughs> but also with, with, you know, going approaching somebody for a mm-hmm. site, do you have the finance already worked out or do you often have, you find the site first and then you kind of go and find investors? So there's, or it's it, probably it a bit of a blend. We already yes. are having conversations with people who know what we're up to and we already have relationships mm. that go back. We've both yes. been around this for a long time Mm. Uh, so we have relationships that go back quite far so they've actually seen us through 
many different aspects of life. Yeah. Mm. Uh, then we actually find the sites, but also are talking to different... We're just maintaining relationships with people who we know who might invest. But it's only once we have a site really truly locked down or close to being locked down that we present that in an investor pack to our investors. investors. So basically once we've knocked on the door and there's a potential for a conversation, we'll have a very light conversation at the door to assess their interest. And then we go to them and bring them into the studio and we do quite a full presentation Mm -hmm. um, and explain what we're about sell a bit of the ethos, we talk a lot about design, mm. we talk about, we're very transparent and we talk about what we actually think so is this possible. So this is to the vendor? Yeah. yeah. To the vendor, yeah. And then we'll put a proposal together and the proposal generally will be quite loose with a few options. So we could either buy it off you now, but that won't be as much. We could buy it off you once it's got planning and it will be a bit more, or we could structure it in a more interesting way. Usually at that point we've understood what it is that they want they need why are they having this conversation with us and so that third structure will usually incorporate aspects of 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 what they really want it may be genuinely that they want the money and they want it quickly in which case the unconditional offer is the one they'll go for and so and so you could you could you could be very creative with this yeah we get quite creative they 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 could retain a bit of equity in it or a slice of the development or something like that so they can stay in yeah and partner with us and they'll get the most money but they'll also then have to take the risk. the risk and also you know to highlight that all the sites that we currently have are failed planning <laughs> I think our first ones failed planning six, six times, times before buying unconditionally so in their that's eyes they're just like site, yeah. that's our first kit site is in their eyes they're like take it like, <laughs> why would you want this they're so, like let's <laughs> recoup our costs we yes. don't really think it's got a huge amount of value so we'll so they accepted our price yes and actually even the second one which is should be a block or will be a block of flats. We're in pre-app with that one. That was um, that had failed planning a number of times, mm. and the gentleman who owns it is very skilled at his trade, but his trade isn't, you know, understanding development and planning. And he was very open at saying that, you know, you put me under the bonnet of a car, and I can do whatever you can possibly imagine. Um, and so he was very willing to let people who who could or who understood it, take it on, and is very excited about what other business opportunities he can do with the money. Yeah. But I think he also understood that we, even when taking it off their hands, we have a responsibility. You know, he lives very closely in the area. Yeah, we and do. it was very important, you know, that he also saw something of quality go onto the site. So we're very conscious of the responsibility, not just to the vendors, but also to our investors. Mm. You know, we take it on as a you know, massive way to really wanting for them to have clarity all the way through the process. So we will give, you know, multiple presentations and we will do the extra to make sure that they feel secure and that also we've investigated, you know, each option of how we... So I was very good at looking at our downside. I'm very, <laughs> I enjoy looking at, you know, the vision of what we'd ideally <laughs> yeah. love to put onto the site and, and all the opportunities. But the you bearer know, of <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, no, but it's good because it's you know we work all the way through to our downside, um, and we we do take massive amounts of responsibility of being able to. Um, deliver Mm. and also we do understand it's our we've always said this you know when you've got investors their money is way more important than the money we've put in yeah you know and looking after so so, so how how does it work then in terms of you know the equity that you put in and investors put in and how do you structure that kind of financial relationship do you create new businesses for each project or how how does the joint venture yeah so again it all depends on the structure so at the moment uh, the three sites that are going through now are all, uh, we've purchased them outright. The next ones to come through are actually going to be a bit more creative. So that will be working <laughs> very closely with our legal uh, representative. Right. To So that will be contractually tying everyone together. Mm. But for the, the simplest way of doing it is we set up a new SPV. Um, a special purpose vehicle, a limited company. Right which will only hold this one asset. We are not very worried about... We understand that they're taking a risk with us. As we said, these sites have generally refused planning multiple times. 
and we have n no desire for them to lose their money. So we have no problem giving them a higher stake in the SPV. So generally right. they take 51% and we take 49 They put the money into the SPV to, uh, to purchase the site and we own it. We jointly own it with them, but there's a whole bunch of contracts that sit in the background, which means that they get the priority return. Should anything go wrong, Got the it. money goes to them first and mm. not to us. And that's something that's owned by Kit. Mm. And then, yes, and then you Kit. Take out your, right, Kit owns that. Kit owns 49%, and their business usually will own yeah. their portion. Yeah. And so, in terms of mitigating the downside and the risks for investors and for yourself, what are the what are the main things that you're that you need to deal with? So we look at, so we have a scheme based on a feasibility, which is brilliant. And that is what we will work our numbers on, but then we'll pull it back. And does it still work if we were to get a reduced scheme? So for example, the site with the flats, we've looked at it as six flats. Does it work at six flats? Yes. <laughs> but could it also work if it was two houses and it still could? If it was only one house, what would that look like and could our investor get their money back and in this scenario they could and then you go down again um, if you were to just sell the site as is could it retain its value in this particular case maybe maybe not but you might have to hold it for a few years but there are others where we've done we've gone out to auction to look at what a site with two garages or a garage and a structure which could fit two garages gone out to look at what has sold in auction what garages have sold for and then based on that, how much she may stand to lose the planning fees. But again, she holds the deciding vote as to whether to sell it or hold it. And she gets priority return of, right, of her okay. money. In that case, we've actually put in a little bit of money, but her money comes back first. And, and who makes an ideal investor? So we work with people who have a lot more experience than us generally. We love working with people that we can learn from, people that we are inspired by. Definitely. Advocates for design. Yeah. People, I think the main thing is just who are able to educate and also are very excited by the whole process, I yeah. think is really important to us. You know, our investors are amazing in They're regards so to, you know, just keeping them updated in a formal and an informal way, just, you know, jumping on the phone, how's it going? They usually understand the risks and thrive in it. They're not, yeah. you know, calling us up going, oh, what's going on? Why is it yeah. going? They give us a lot of patience and time and they can also appreciate that it does take time and they, they give us breathing space to d discuss the issues and allow a space for us to go through all the risks and you know how do we need to mitigate this how can we problem solve and we can you know bounce ideas off of them and mm. they're very active in a thought process and then we go and do all the running around and, you, yeah. know, the actual, you know the work in regards to um dealing with the actual development process <laughs> itself and the teams the and everything, parts, all yeah. the various it, parts. It, it's really interesting how, you, how you've kind of been very selective in, in having investors who are experienced oh, investors so yeah. rather than kind of doing, you know, the kind of friends and family or anybody who can jump no. into stuff. And, no. You know, and I mean, that becomes another risk in itself. Exactly. We need people who can who understand what they're getting into. Yes. And and they're sophisticated, which is actually, you know, the formal yeah. Yeah. term, but they're sophisticated in their approach mm. to it. Um, yeah, and as you say, it can be a risk. It's a, we don't need the extra pressure. We need, you know, we want people who will champion and love it. And the other thing is it needs to be important to us that they can weather any storm as Remy says it takes time and if they need that money somewhere else yeah we are not going to be able to move it property is intrinsically liquid mm. so um but they also understand in regards to the value behind design yeah and they understand that we you know run our comparables in regards to an average in the area <laughs> yeah. when we're doing the appraisal <laughs> but they also can appreciate the premium of design from a financial and from, you know, a contextual point of view of what, you know, we're developing, you know, we all like sleeping well at night and our, our investors, you know, what they feel that they're investing in something positive within the built environment instead of the fact that we are just trying to draw money out, even though obviously, like we mentioned, the appraisal needs to look lovely, but at the same time they can, they buy into the story and they're and they've got an education that they've been able to teach us on how to do it in the best way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're just great in regards to understanding the full vision, which is really mm -hmm. fun. So, so when you 
the relationships you have with investors can, like as you were saying, like sometimes from previous relationships, previous ventures, yes. um, then you can kind of go when you when you found a site and you've kind of made some offers or you've got a, a basic appraisal. What's what's in that appraisal? What, what's Ooh, how, what numbers <laughs> are in our financial appraisal Not, or our investor pack? Yeah. What 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 kind of information do you put in there? So there's a lot of what information makes it, what about what makes a good appraisal basically. So the actual financial appraisal is like taking the feasibility and and what we believe is possible, taking comparables, so understanding what your end value is going to be, your GDP, um, which is obviously very important. The price you're paying for it, you've got things like gross gross development value. So you want to know, we use it on a per square foot, so we work it out on square footage and do it that way. But you can also know what a two-bed flat in the area will sell for. Again, as Remy said, we're quite conservative. We don't factor in a new build premium. We don't really factor in design. We kind of take we take nice properties, but we'll also look at ones that need modernisation and take an average, uh, which sometimes gets us in, me into trouble because we've got hiked up build costs, but really quite conservative resales. Right. But it's better to be safe. It's, it's, yes, okay, so it's that's ten the, times you're, better so to that be safe. So that is how we balance you're, you're it. Kind of, yeah, exactly. So Even then though we got, believe in the value. We massively believe in the value <laughs> of design, but we don't count our chickens. And nobody knows where the market is going. Yes, so. it keeps us all safe. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that kind of removes the element of kind of wild what speculation. If, and Yeah, yeah. Exactly. what if the market dropped by 10%? Well, we haven't added in the design premium. So actually, if numbers can work like this, they can work. Mm. So then within that, you're going to have your purchase price if you're buying it outright, your stamp duty cost, your legal fees, your planning costs. You're going to go into your construction costs. How much is that going to cost? Some contingency in there. You'll have your professional fees. You may have a development management right. fee. You'll have things like Section 106 or SIL payments, so community infrastructure levy and your S106, so that needs to be factored in. And then you will go into your finance costs. So chances are, even though you're working with an equity partner or an investor, you will be using some sort of debt bank finance. And how much is that actually going to cost you? Or even if you're working with an investor, you may have agreed an interest return. So that needs to be factored in. You need to have your agents. When you go to sell these properties, the estate agents or whoever's representing you will take a fee. You may even have a marketing budget in there to do the interiors uh, designs. And then you'll also have a conveyancing fee, so your legals to get it sold, so per unit. And once you've got all of that, you should be able to get your end value, which is the money that you will hopefully take home. That needs to be at 20% of GDV or 25% of cost, which gives you a buffer to be able to weather Increased construction. At the end of it, the numbers can look really very attractive. Um, but really, what in our view, I think, or what you're trying to do with that is mitigate. What you don't want to do is go under. So if you've got that buffer and that is strong, you can spend a bit more on design and, and things can move and you'll be okay. Are, are there certain regulations that you need to adhere to in terms of if you're doing a speculation or an appraisal and, and you're, and, I mean, you're kind of, putting together an idea of what the GDP could be and what the kind of returns Mm -hmm. could be. Are there regulations about in round like what you can promise or what you say or how do you how do you sell that to investors? What's the sort of So there's there's regulation around who you can promote it to. So you have to know that they have they are, as per the FCA guidelines, either high net worth or sophisticated. And if they are you can have these conversations because they're gonna understand what what's the the definition of Finding someone as a sophisticated investor. Or They're actually really quite complex. So right, the best okay. thing to do is go and look on the FCA. But one of them is have they invested in an unlisted company more than once okay. before? So have they had an experience where they've invested in something that could go up and could go down? Mm-hmm. Hence why they can then understand that what you're putting forward is a guide, not necessarily set in stone you know it's based on today's market yes markets change and they yeah so they've got the experience they understand what the risk that they're getting into yeah. whereas somebody who's not a sophisticated investor and it's the first time it's their entire life savings this yeah is, disaster this we wouldn't know that's a disaster <laughs> we wouldn't touch yeah them. and it's not something for you to be dealing with that kind of 
no. stress. And, and so in terms of, uh, so, you, so you're actually involved a little bit and then in terms of the institutional finance that investors might be needing to get themselves. No. No, no. That, that's, so that's their business. That's their, we actually wouldn't, we wouldn't take, I don't think we would take money that was borrowed money to then put into this. Yeah. That's, that's, These are people who are liquid. They Got have it. that liquid funds. But we would take out development finance for the construction phase. Yeah. So that would be Your us risk. and has yeah. the SPV. The SPV would hold it. So they would be involved in that and very aware of what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's all completely it's transparent. It's all completely transparent. Very nice. And so how does it, how then... As your studio, so you've got kit. You're also you've got your own studio. Mm -hmm. How does the contractual relationship with your studio work, or are or is kit employing architects in house, or is your studio doing the doing the work? Or no, so it's you know in the sense of most development and consultants relationship, kit hires the studio to do the consultancy, okay. the architectural consultancy. So it keeps it quite clean and straightforward, and all the rest of it. But then the studio has an extra you know, involvement in the development. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. In regards to... It's like 50%. <laughs> <laughs> like 50% in regards to the fact that we... The studio is very involved in, you know, the discussions as a whole studio, as a collective of people. It's, you know, for them to be able to understand all the rules so they know how to break them, as we like to say. Yeah. Um, and that's something that it does then end up kind of being this kind of interlocking partnership, we say. But in regards to the structure, it's the fact that Kit hires the studio to do the consultancy. But due to myself being within both parties... You know, there is definitely, you know, a premium in regards to ownership and it's very important for the studio know, good, to have. It's a good position. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what's been quite good is that, you know, even when it's come to, you know, clients and so on for the studio, mm. um, separately is the fact that we have this education. Yeah. We can appreciate, you know, mm. what the developer's going through. So if anything, when clients come to us, mm. we're able to understand the risk they're taking, understand their financial models, understand everything that needs to happen to yeah. actually get the job done. Mm. So from the book, from, you know, from conception to completion, we truly understand the full story. So that is something that we're able to offer as a studio is that understanding down to everybody involved because mm. it's such an open dialogue. Um, I think Kit enormously benefits from working with Remy CT Studio, with Remy <laughs> at the head of both, you know. We end up with, as you said, they're, you're invested in it, and the mm. studio is so passionate about it. They hear about these projects from, you know, the first conversation, mm. which means that we get an amazing experience. Mm. Um, uh yeah, and as I think we, it works. Really. And something I know I've already I keep banging on about it, but I'm just really <laughs> excited. <laughs> but it's really nice as a designers, as the designers, and everybody within mm. the studio. One of the things that we're doing this year is actually getting the studio to have you know partnership um, within the developments that we do moving forward, so that they have a bit of ownership of profit. So they're developers in their own right. So they understand that when something gets sold, that they make a profit from it such as ourselves that's so they're invested how does that work so they'll own basically we we are taking one of the initial developments yeah. that the studio has done and we're gifting part of the profits to the studio and the studio then is taking those profits and reinvesting them into such as kit projects and then that means that they get a small profit later on at the end so we're not asking them to invest money but we are asking, we, but we're saying that we appreciate the extra time and the consideration that is going into the project. So obviously they get paid as consultants yeah. within the studio, but they also get to benefit, you know, being around, you know, here. In and legally we're working on how all of that structure, structure. Yeah. works. Amazing. That's, that's develop, that starts to develop a really unique culture within your, mm. within your practice of mm. kind of very commercially intelligent architects or well, they've got an interest in it well I think designers are really good at the power of ownership yeah. <laughs> you know you get so invested in every design like literally every design that comes into the studio you know from you know working at all different scales 
you know, the extensions to new build homes, to master plans, to boats, to whatever it may be. Mm. We get so invested and we get so excited about everything. And the studio is so good, not separately even from the kit projects, take so much ownership and they get so proud. Anybody does when they're looking after a scheme. And I think it's also just kind of monetizing that as well and giving that extra premium and I think also from the kit projects because they're able like we said to see you know everything that happens it translates in uh, very well for the studio in regards to when we take on clients the studio under starts to understand also what the client's going through and it just works for everybody involved mm. and it gives them an incentive to you know be chasing people because <laughs> they want the, job. Out the planet. they're coming out they're wanting to get the job done too and they're also wanting they're caring about the details in a different way they're like talking about more so the experience of who's going to be buying this it's interesting somebody in the studio was like okay so when you sell the development how are we <laughs> you know they were talking about marketing strategy and it's really interesting they were already talking about the killer views you know in regards to how do we photograph it how who do we talk they're very they're interested even post construction the user they're starting to understand those elements too so and that it's all design you know mm -hmm. how we set it up we want to have you know a certain lifestyle within all mm -hmm. of our products um, and they start to get excited about that in too and understand mm. that that's a volume of design yeah. in itself. Well, I like that you're using the word product. Like, mm. and, and, and it's kind of nice. I mean, it's, it's amazing, really. Mm. So inspiring to hear both of you. Um, and I really love the fact that you're given, you know, that you're involving the culture of, the, of your team mm. to be able to, you know, to win as well mm. in, terms yeah. of, in terms of, the, you know, as designers, as creative people, you know, if you look at musicians, even for mm. example, you know, if you if you get a, a song that sells out loads, that's a kind mm. of recurring piece of mm. revenue. Whereas mm. architects often, we don't have we don't methods for um, mm. having a continual stream of revenue coming mm. off our intellectual property. Mm. And so, well, if we get to hold them, then they'll feel that continuous revenue kind of come in of what their product, you know, means. And I think mm. it's. I think it's really nice in regards to for them to also see like the growth of how it all kind of interlocks and so on as well. And every, you know, from vendor all the way to the user and mm. everybody in between, like Sarah said, is like so important to us. We, mm. you know, we're so thankful to, you know, our contractors and the builders that we work with. Like Sarah said, we go out for drinks and the team kind of take our builders out for drinks now <laughs> as well. Um, and it's great to see because it, everybody's so invested. And also, you know, a, a, even a single house, it takes three years. It's a long time. Mm -hmm. So it, you want to be around a team of people who are excited and, you know, who are it. invested in different ways mm -hmm. um, from everybody involved. And it's a more enjoyable experience for us because we, you know, enjoy kit and we enjoy the whole process and everything <laughs> about it. It's nice when everybody else kind of gets that energy and also gets a piece of it. Um, and it gets quantified in you know multiple ways. We're still a new startup studio kit. Is still a new startup in practice infancy, yeah. in its infancy. But you know where we can share, we want to because we're looking at a business. We're not looking about we need to just draw out as much finance yeah. from each product. We're looking at a bigger vision of how development can be done, mm. um, and we're excited to share that and you know play with it as much as possible. I've, I've spoken to architects before who have often uh, expressed a hesitancy to being involved in development for not wanting to be in conflict with their clients. Is that something that yeah. you've ever considered as being, a, could be a problem or... In conflict with their clients? Yeah, in terms of like get, com both competing for the same site or something like it's that. It's interesting because we've had clients that actually literally work within, you know, the same um, boroughs and so on. And so far... A lot of our clients appreciate what we do because mm. we bring the same energy to their sites. Mm. So we've got clients who, you know, know even, you know, know Sarah in the office and all the rest of it, and they actually bounce ideas off of each other. And they say, well, they, "I want to bring a site forward that we'll all work on." You know, like literally, we've had clients who it benefits because the more we know, the more that that can then the studio can take that and harness it into their projects as well. And I think. If you are proactive about how you find sites, there are enough sites. You don't need to... If you go to the open market, yes, you start competing and it becomes all about price. 
But if you pursue different avenues, there are enough sites around if you can get your business model right and really hone it and work mm. hard. Mm. And I think, yeah, our, our clients kind of get more value, if anything, you know, for when, when they're coming to us, we're really trying to, like we said, we can appreciate what they're going through. And we, sh you know, I'll say to them, they'll come up and say, oh, we've got an issue about this. And if I don't know it, I sometimes, you know, bounce the ideas of Sarah, like, oh, how would, do you think it would be better for them to structure it and so on? And then it allows us to, pro there's been a series of clients that we've been able to problem solve and strategize the development side for them, yeah. not just the design side. And we're all we have designed massively understanding the rules of their development and what options they're on, or one thing or another. And I think they understand that, and they can just see how we work. They can see that we value, you know, their proposal just as much as we value our own. And so they can, and it, so it hasn't. If anything, it's aided us. Because it's that whole thing about learning all the rules so you can break all the rules. You can't break them or you can't, you know, adjust them and be innovative within them if you don't understand them. And I think Kit has allowed us to do so. And if anything, it gets us more excited about all the opportunities of what else we can kind of do with it. Mm -hmm. but Brilliant. So what's, what's in store for the rest of 2020? <sighs> so a few planning apps. <laughs> a few planning, a few more sites, um, some really interesting structures, mm. some a bit more complex. And then, as we said, we would like one commercial to start to really understand uh, that market and really right. push it. Mm. So then, yeah, it's growth, continuing to do what we do, you know, get to the point of delivering some of these amazing units. Mm. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for your you. time this morning. I really found this so inspirational and really insightful. And you've been very clear with, you know, explaining your processes. And I look forward to speaking with you guys again, having you on the show again, maybe <laughs> as we start to see some of the, the you know, developments getting, developments getting completed. Yes. Yeah, we'd love that. Yes, Brilliant. we'd love that. Thank you for having thank us. You. <laughs> and that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.